Welcome to a glorious morning here in Heimville, in the southern Drakensberg. Welcome to St. Michael's Church here in Heimville for another in our series on the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We're going to ask the Lord to bless this teaching and this time that we have together. And my prayer for you and for all my viewers is that you would be blessed by this morning's teaching as well as challenged because it is a challenging teaching and so father we do pray that as your word is expounded and as we look more deeply into paul's letter that you would indeed encourage us by this word but also enrich us and enliven us lord to understand more and more about your word and about those who are on the outside looking in Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministry of teaching. And thank you, Jesus, for your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. So as you will have read, we were looking at 1 Corinthians 1 verses 18 to 31 and 1 Corinthians 2 verses 1 to 7. I think the first question I would like to ask you this morning, because it is a challenging question, is do you believe the Bible? Do you believe that the Bible is the ordained, inspired Word of God, written by men, but inspired by the Holy Spirit? You see, many people don't believe that. And we're going to see this morning why many people don't believe that, and why they're not able to accept that Jesus is the Lord of all. Do you believe that in the words of what would happen if you went to court, do you believe that the Bible is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I was saying to somebody just the other day that when I was called to be a Christian, I used to not know anything about the Bible until a friend of mine gave me what was then known as the Living Bible. It was a a paraphrase and I remember saying to people that I read it from Genesis all the way through to maps and I did not understand anything of what I was reading but very clearly the Lord had a message for me because it was then that I really began to take Christianity and the Lord Jesus seriously how did I come to believe that the Bible is the Bible how did I come to believe that the Word of God is the Word of God? It can only happen when the Holy Spirit begins to minister into our lives. And you will have heard me say before that the great father of the church once said, we believe that we may understand. We don't understand first and then believe. And this is the problem with so many people. Until they can actually understand Scripture and some of the anomalies that we find in Scripture, they will not believe. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at what John Calvin said. He said, the Scriptures themselves manifest plainly that God is the speaker. We are never established in the faith of this doctrine until we are indubitably persuaded that God is the author. You see, we need what is known as divine revelation. And I'm reminded of that passage in Matthew 16, from verses 13, 16 and 17, which said this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now you will remember that this was a place called Banias, right up on the northern territory of Israel, close to the Syrian border. And Simon Peter answered, saying, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, until we are the children of the Father, until we have accepted that Jesus is our Lord and our brother, and that we are members of the family of God, 
we're not going to have that kind of inspiration that Simon Peter had. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 verse says this, Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You see, we need the intervention of the Holy Spirit to begin to minister into our logical minds and often illogical minds to say this is the Word of God. Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so we can only accept that Father is God, or God is Father, when we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 says this, But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. And you will remember that that's the story about Paul using Moses as an example, who used to come out of the tabernacle and put a veil over his face so that the people wouldn't see the glow going away from his face. And what he's saying is, until we repent and believe that Jesus is Lord, we will have that veil covering our faces and we will not be able to understand what Scripture is all about. And then John 6.44 says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. Everything that we know and do as Christians has its initiative in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Romans, 5 verses, Romans 8 verses 5 to 8 says this, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. I think that's the important little line there. Nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You see, because of sin, and through our sin, it is just not possible to say, I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The initiative has to come, first of all, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to begin to look at two important aspects of 1 Corinthians. There are two major sections in this Bible section, which says, why non-Christians reject the Bible. And next time we're going to look at why born-again Christians accept the Bible. So section one, why do non-Christians reject the Bible? We cannot, through clever methods and programs and emotional blackmail, try and get people to accept the Bible as the Word of God. Human reason does not allow us to accept the Bible as it is, to accept the validity and the divine nature of the Bible. It all has to do with the condition that the individual finds himself in. And again, many people will argue about this, but our condition biblically and in person is the fact that we are in the flesh. We are not in the spirit. Our condition as unregenerated non-transformed people is that of being in the flesh. And Paul very clearly said that in the flesh we are governed by the flesh. So, what are the four reasons that non-believers reject the divine truth of the Bible? The first one comes as the message is unreasonable to human reason. Listen to what Paul says in our passage. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, 
Notice that is us who are being saved. We are being saved until the time that the Lord comes or that we go to be with the Lord. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You see, it's a foolish gospel to those who are not believing. But to us, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling jock to the block to the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I said in a sermon recently that the Lord finds us even when we are not looking for him. And that is wonderful, wonderful good news. But we still need to respond. And I know many people who have had many, many opportunities to accept the Lord as his Lord and Savior, or as her Lord and Savior, and they have not responded, they have rejected. Can you think of a time when you felt the calling from the Lord, and at that time you said, I can't accept this now. Wait for me, Lord. And you know the time will come when the Lord will stop waiting. Now what we're saying is that a God, a crucified God, is ridiculous to Jews and Gentiles. Salvation by faith in a crucified God is even more ridiculous. Those things just don't make sense to those who are perishing. And it's very, very interesting that the Greek word for foolishness is moria, M-O-R-I-A, from where we get the word moros, or moron, or silliness. You see, what Paul is saying, and what the word is saying, is that those who are foolish by not rejecting the word of the Lord are actually behaving like silly morons. The second reason that people battle to accept the word of the Lord is that the reality of the gospel is unattainable, unattainable on human level. We've all heard wonderful stories of faith, but how do they affect my life? Because the gospel makes no sense. What is the gospel? The gospel is so simple, so straightforward, that one man, the God-man, came into the world, took upon himself the nature of a slave, came to earth to die as one man for the sins of the whole universe. Please, they will say, don't give me that kind of story. That's impossible. Listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 29, 14 and 15 says, Therefore, once more I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide the plans of the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, Who sees us? Who will know? Woe to those in the world in which we live who are trying to draw people away from the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. You see, actually it pleases God that intellectually we cannot think our way into Christianity. Think about that for a moment. It pleases God that intellectually we cannot think our way into Christianity. We need to take that step of saying, Lord Jesus, I don't understand anything of what's going on at the moment, but I accept that you are the Lord. You are the Savior of mankind. You see, the Afrikaans people have a wonderful expression. They say, slim, fang se bas. In other words, when you are too clever, it catches you out. When we are too clever, too clever, trying to work out the gospel, and at the same time making excuses, eventually we're going to get caught out. It is just not possible to cross that valley between sin and Jesus 
without the ministry of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and our Father. Third reason why people struggle to accept the Word of God is that it is unbelievable and ridiculous. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. Now you know what's interesting about John's Gospel particularly? is that every single miracle that Jesus performed in John's Gospel is known in Greek as Simeon, which is a sign or a flag waving. Surely, Jesus gave the Jews many, many signs and wonders. He gave them many Simeon in his three years of ministry on the earth. But they weren't looking for ordinary miracles. They were looking for the big ones. They wanted Jesus, if he was the Messiah, to get rid of the Roman persecutors. He wanted, they wanted Jesus to come in riding on a white stallion at the head of a mighty army like King David to get rid of these people and set up the promised kingdom of God as the Messiah El Supremo. They wanted Jesus to replace the Romans with the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. If you read Genesis 12 and 15, this is the most central to the biblical story. God promises Abraham a land, descendants and blessing. This blessing promised to Abraham would extend through him to all peoples of the earth. Understanding the Abrahamic covenant is paramount to understand theological concepts like the promised land, election, the people of God, inheritance and so on. It provides context for understanding practices like circumcision, conflicts with surrounding nations and divisions between Jews and Gentiles. The Davidic covenant, if you'll read that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is the covenant where God promises a descendant of David to reign on the throne over the people of God. It is a continuation of the earlier covenants in that it promises a Davidic king as the figure through whom God would secure the promises of land, descendants and blessing. And this covenant becomes the basis for hope of a Messiah and makes sense of the Gospels concern to show Jesus was the rightful king of the Jews. I've just been quoting the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, and I would suggest that you look into it a little bit further. When Jesus was taken to the cross of Calvary, that was it. There was no more hope for any Abrahamic covenants or Davidic covenants. That's what the people believed. Instead, what did Jesus do? He condemned the hypocrisy of the Jews. And consequently, our hypocrisy. He showed absolutely no willingness to get rid of the Romans or to defeat them. They even scoffed and challenged him to the, on the cross to say, come down if you are the Messiah. The fact that Jesus, the Messiah, could be crucified was just one step too far for the Jews. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. The Greeks at the time, looking for wisdom, fancied themselves as the orators and the debaters par excellence. They were profound and intricate and complete intellectuals. They scoffed at the fact that these Christians, these simple dolts who called themselves of the way, could worship a crucified God. Can you imagine that? They loved the intellectual maze-like debates and teaching with profound, mind-boggling conclusions. But they could not accept the fact that the crucified God was Jesus the Messiah. There is a very, very interesting bit of graffiti which I have found out about. It's called the Alexamenos Graffito, also known as the Graffito Blasphemo or blasphemous graffiti. It's a piece of Roman graffiti scratched in plaster on the wall of a room near the Palatine Hill in Rome. 
which has now been removed and is in the Palatine Museum. It may be meant, and people believe it is meant, to depict Jesus. If so, it competes with an engraved gem as the earliest known pictorial representation of the crucifixion of Jesus. It is hard to date, but has been estimated to have been made at around the year 200. The image seems to show a young man worshipping a crucified donkey-headed figure. The Greek, in Greek inscription approximately translates to Alexamenos worships his God, indicating that the graffito was apparently meant to mock a Christian named Alexamenos. Can you imagine that graffiti showing Jesus crucified with a donkey's head? That's what the Greeks thought of our crucified Messiah. And lastly today, the fourth reason believers cannot, unbelievers cannot believe that the believers in Jesus were any way near what they should be. They regarded them as unremarkable people. 1 Corinthians 1.26 Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble, of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. No one may boast before him. You see, in many, many societies, even today, and in the society in, we, in which we live, Christians are regarded as being the least impressive people in the community. The world, and especially the world media, mocks Christians. You only have to see what is going on in dramas and soaps and series today. It is difficult to find any series or picture or film that does not mock Christians and God our Father. And you know, even as clergy, we are not held in high esteem. If you look at photographs of clergy, and caricatures of clergy, and clergy that appear in soaps and dramas. They're all regarded as rather silly individuals. They fit into one particular form of individual. They're regarded as weak characters who are basket cases. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 1 to 5 says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. My brothers and sisters, I pray that something of this very technical teaching that we've had today will find a place in your hearts. And that each one of us, and I include myself in this, will say, Lord, thank you that you revealed yourself to me in a way which was your initiative and your ordination. Thank you, Lord, that I can come to you not with my own pride and my own gifts and my own talents. Everything that I have comes from you. And I'm reminded that Jesus himself said, you can do nothing without me. Thank you, Father, for this time that we've had together. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your intervention in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.